knows my name. Can you just say, I thank God? Can you high five the person to your left and to your right and say, I thank God? I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. He raised me up. He gave me strength. He gave me joy. I need somebody that's grateful on this Sunday morning to say, I thank God. Hallelujah. Let's go. Y'all ready, Redemption? Everybody clap your hands. Somebody shout hallelujah in this house today. Oh, yeah. Yes, Lord. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. These vagabonds. <laughs> and I try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A vagabond. Come on, we say it together. But just when I ran out of room, I made a
that you're facing today I want you to know your God is more than able I wish I had somebody that had crazy faith I, in the face of what doctors say and in the face of what the bank says and in the face of what your past has said I know a God the only true living God he's more than able can we say father you're more than able hallelujah I've seen your resume. <laughs> yes, I've seen your resume. You're more than able. Hallelujah. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith? For the impossible And when did I start to believe That you weren't sufficient for me Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles I should already know That you are more than it Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? It's too easy for you. Hey. Now I see all that I have. Oh, I've got my confidence back. Oh, I put my trust in the one. Just be 
Yes, I've seen you do it. The devil is a liar. I've seen you do it. Hey, the devil is a liar. I've seen you do it. You can do the impossible. I've seen you do it. You can make cancer disappear. God, I've seen you do it. You can make cancer disappear. God, I've seen you do it. that you feel too afraid to say out loud. I came to prophesy to you. God is more than. That's who he is. That's who he is. God is more than a. So who am I to deny what the Lord can do? I've come a long way I've seen how you work There's so much goodness and grace Much more than I deserve Cause I know who I am And I can't stay where I am at. We come this far by faith And I just can't turn back Cause he's not done with me yet He's not done with me You're not done with me You're not done with me There's so much more to the story You're not done with me Say you're not done, you're, you're not, not done, done with me I wanted to give up on myself but you said you're not done with me
Jesus Hold me in your arms I've done everything To make you turn away I'm indebted to your goodness I don't deserve your love But you took everything And you threw it all away I know this is forgiveness This is the story of How my sins are sinking in the sea Never to rise again That's what you've done for
should have been forgotten about. You should have wrote me off. But all my sins are in the sea. Sink it to rise no more. Thank you for forgiving me. Hey. And now my sins are sinking in the sea. Never to rise again. That's what you've done for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgive and forget. There is power in the name of Jesus. <laughs> there is power in the name of Jesus. What does it do now? Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. 
I want you to tell three people right now, say it's broken. Come on, tell them. It's broken. It's broken. <laughs> now stay right there where you are. 60 more seconds. If you are in this place and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, how in the world can you miss out on what everybody else in this building has experienced right now? You know, they talk a lot today. One of the buzzwords is inclusion. You know that Jesus is inclusionary? But he's not inclusion for affirmation, he's inclusion for transformation. Because grace takes you like you are, but grace never keeps you like you are. This is a transformational moment. It's not where you just keep on going in your pain and pick up a Jesus on the side. It's when he comes to live on the inside and everything in your life begins to change. That's what this moment is. Heads bowed and eyes closed, if you would, please, for just a moment. Very simply put, if you don't know him, if he's not in your heart, if you don't know the peace and joy internally, if you don't know what it is to make the ache go away, if it feels like you've tried to fill yourself with everything but there's a hole in your bucket, I was also reading Jeremiah 3 yesterday. He said, this I hold against you. Excuse me, Jeremiah 2. And he said that you've tried to create fountains for yourself, but they are cisterns that do not hold water. In other words, you've tried every way in the world to make yourself feel significant and fulfilled, but it's like there's a hole in your bucket. Jesus is your answer. Your problem is not around you. Your problem is in you. And Jesus solves that problem. Every head bowed and every eye closed, just me, you, and Jesus looking. Pastor, I want to accept him now. I don't want to leave any longer with this ache in my soul. If that's you right now, just lift your hand wherever you are. Wherever you are right now. Yeah, I see two hands, three hands, four hands, five, six, seven, eight hands have gone up. Eight hands, nine hands have gone up. Ten hands have gone up. Eleven hands have gone up. Wow, 9 o'clock in the morning, 11 and 12 hands. I saw you, sister. 12 hands going up. Hallelujah. 13 hands that just went up. 14 hands just went up. Can we bless the Lord for that? Bless the Lord. All right, just like you were singing about the chains, I need you to help me out. Nobody does this alone. We do this as a family. Ready? Let's go. Say thank you, Jesus that you have chain-breaking power, that you can heal the ache inside my soul. You can put the broken pieces together again. So today, I lay my life in your hands, believing and confessing that you died and rose on the third day to purchase my salvation. Come live in me, cleanse me, wash me be my lord and savior from this moment forward and i thank you for it in jesus name and everybody said amen come on let's take a deep breath and give god one more great big praise 14 people hallelujah just raised their hand and got saved spread some love in this building everybody within your reach come on handshake hug their neck let them know you're glad they're in the house of god If you made the decision to follow Jesus, the journey of your life has forever been changed for the better. Let us know about your decision by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. Is this your first time joining us online? Welcome! Introduce yourself to us by texting the number at the bottom of your screen. Have you joined a life group yet? We're better together than apart. Do life with one another by going to i.church and clicking on Grow. Have you gone through growth track yet? Discover your purpose and get on the right track to fulfilling your God-given destiny. Join by going to i.church and clicking on grow. Now let's head back into service. God is good. I'm telling you what God did at these altars we'll be hearing about for weeks. Some of you were changed forever. Changed forever. 
God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. How many of y'all's mama told y'all that trying to get y'all to act right? Okay, y'all weren't raised in the South. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> that was the God scare tactic. And when you're 16 years old and you're going out the front door and your daddy knows you're up to no good, God will not be mocked, son. Whatever a man sows, that will. So it always was brought to me in a negative light, trying to hold me in some boundaries. But that law works both ways. Whatever a man sows, that, what? That, what is that? That which he sows. That sh so in other words, what goes out from you will come back around and revisit you. The world calls it karma. God calls it sowing and reaping. It is the fundamental law of the kingdom. And the Bible says God will not be mocked. And then the next verse, whatever man sows, that shall else reap. Galatians, Galatians 6, verses 6 through 9. Go read them. Why does God put those two things together? Because it would mock God's system if you could get something out of it you didn't put in it. You want something out of your marriage? God will not be mocked. Whatever you put in it is what you'll get. Oh. You want your own business? I can promise you, whatever you put in it, God will not be mocked. That's what you'll get out of it. Because God's system is there's something that goes out from you and then comes back around and visits you and it's greater when it comes back than it was when it left. Some people, it's so hard for them to give because some of you, when you give, you think something is leaving your life. That's why when that envelope goes out, you... <laughs> it's like you're going through a grieving process while it's dropping in the bucket. It's not leaving your life, it's leaving your hand. And now it's going in God's process. And then it's gonna come right back around and revisit you greater than when it left your hand. Because you know what giving is? Giving is emptying out my today so I can fill up my tomorrow. That's what giving is. So Lord, I pray that you would bring generosity to this place. Everyone under the sound of my voice, we would give cheerfully. We don't, we don't want you to be mocked. We wanna be generous givers that we may reap generously back from our Lord. So Lord, bless this tithe and offering time mightily, I pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen with me. Amen. Here's all the ways you can give. Praise team, I need you. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody sing yeah. yeah, yeah. We're gonna sing this song of faith. Uh, they say it can doing i'm pastor ron this is redemption and i'm so glad that you're worshiping with us today and wow miracles people be getting saved healings god breaking bondages in this place it's been amazing and i hope that you've been able to be a part of that if not stick around god's not finished and this is the moment where we give to the lord and god won't be mocked like i said whatever a man soweth that's how he also reap this is the moment where you empty out today to make sure that your tomorrow is greater. Seed always has the potential to create tomorrows that are greater than today's. Don't ever let this moment pass you by. So you may be an I church member. This may be your tithing church where you bring your tithing offering to God. You may be just passing through and say, this blesses me. I got a home church, but I want to give. I want to do something. Whatever it is, you just obey God. You know what your relationship to this ministry is. You just obey the heart of God, and you can't miss whenever you do that. Don't leave because we're still in this thing called enemies, and I can't wait to deliver this one. So I'll see you in just a minute. More people have chosen to use text to give as their preferred way of giving because it is safe, quick, and very easy. Here's how it works. Open a new text message on your phone and use your text to give number. Text RCM to 864-920-1282. The very first time you use the service to give, you will receive a text message with a link to a registration form. Click the link in the text and it will direct you to enter your information. 
You will only have to enter your information once to set up the service. Then it's a matter of seconds to give. It's safe and secure, easy to use, and you will receive an instant receipt. Add your text to give number in your contact list so you'll have it ready. That's it, giving has never been so easy. And we thank you for your generosity. Hello to my wonderful Facebook family and our YouTube Live family. Listen, we love you guys, we really do. And we're about to give away 10 books. Uh, I'm doing it on our East Coast campus, on our West Coast campus, our iChurch, where if you would really like a deeper community with redemption, you can get involved in that right now. Go through our website and just hit iChurch, and there's going to be an amazing people that call redemption their home, although most of them live all over the world. Never been under the roof, but we pastor them. We love you, and we thank you for joining us. Now, here's what I need you to do. You get a chance to win one of those 10 books. You can buy them anytime at our online bookstore, but we're giving away 10 each week while I'm doing this series on enemies. Go to roncarpenter.com slash enemies. roncarpenter.com slash enemies, and you will get your chance to win. Hopefully, it's you, and we'll let you know just as soon as we can. Now, without any further ado, are you ready for some more of this? Because we ain't even got to the best stuff yet. Go with me on this new journey into why we have enemies. I am going to pursue what God's got for my life. A persecution will come again. Well, who do you think you are? Well, nobody in our families ever. You need to quit trying to act like you ain't just one of us. Rejoice and be glad because there's a great and effective door awaiting me. And there are many adversaries. You will outlive this devil. You will overcome this devil. And in the name of Jesus, you will open a door. <laughs> He's fired up. I don't know about me. I'm a, that guy's ready to go. Y'all been enjoying enemies? <clears throat> guys, it's going to take me a lot longer than I thought. Um, I just, uh, they, they really do. My, we, have, we have media and marketing. We have all those people. They're all really smart and good at what they do. That's why they're here. <clears throat> and they tell me that I need, you know, every four to eight weeks, I really need to change this thing up. But I just... I mean, I ain't even got to the good stuff. But uh, in short, enemies, you know, you're like, I, yeah, I don't go to church to learn about enemies. I want to hear about love and grace and mercy and all that kind of good stuff. There's enough enemies out there in the world. Why I got to come here to church? <clears throat> because enemies are necessary. Remember this saying, okay? Your friends comfort you. Your family humbles you. Your enemies promote you. Friends comfort you. Family humbles you. Your enemies promote you. There is no promotion without enemies. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. I won't read it. I'll just quote it. That verse says, For there's a great and effective door open for me, but there are many adversaries. In short, two minutes. This whole series has this premise running through it that I've got to rejoice and be exceedingly glad, not when I open a door, but when I see an enemy. Jesus said, blessed are you when men revile you, when men persecute or come against you, create difficulty in your life. When men speak all manner of evil against you falsely, when they lying on you and defaming you. You thought you were blessed when your bank account was full and the paper was writing great articles about you. He says, no, he said, when these things are happening, he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. What? He said, for great is your reward. In other words, the size of your reward always parallels the size of your attack. Because to get great rewards, you have to fight great battles. I've always told people, people want to be great, exceptional people, but you can't be exceptional and fight ordinary battles. Exceptional people fight exceptional battles, okay? And so basically what the Bible is teaching that the announcement of an enemy is the announcement of your next season. It announces to you that God is totally finished with what you have just experienced 
and a new door is open, but between the old door closing and the new door opening, there is going to be a giant you're going to have to kill. There's going to be something you're going to have to engage it and you're going to have to overcome it. So that's been the whole premise of the whole series and everything in between. I'm just adding some of the details. If you enjoyed any of it so far, I really hope that it's helped you. I've gotten a lot of great feedback. One enemy that I'm facing this morning is this baggy jeans. <laughs> Hallelujah. Exodus 13, verse 17. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the land of the Philistines, although that was near. God didn't take them the shortest route. They're coming out of Egypt. I've given you a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's a straight line. We're not going to go in a straight line. We're going to take the long way. God did not lead them by that way, although it was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war. Ooh. And return to their last season. Remember, when a season is over, you can either go around and repeat it. That's called a cycle. You're locked in a cycle or you can engage the giant and move on through your next door. Look at what God is saying. I'm finished with Pharaoh's season. I've got a season of a promised land and in the middle of it, there's a Pharaoh. And if they, if they, if I don't get them right internally, they will see conflict and retreat. So Father, bless the reading of your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. We talked to each other in this church. Say, neighbor, say, here we go, neighbor, here we go. <clears throat> um, we will not be through at our normal time. Just wanted to let you know, if you need to bring a banana with you and eat it, that's fine, whatever you got to do. I know our service has been a little bit longer, but man, it's been fun, hasn't it? It's been so much fun. God's good. <clears throat> not going to apologize for it, just going to do what we do. Just going to let God move and do what we do. I stayed in, in Exodus 13 about the whole time. I, I really meant to jumpstart from it, and it just, I kept going. I kept going. I turned around, and I've been a half hour and hadn't even gotten my other stuff. So let me try to do this a, a, little, a little more quickly. Um, I, I was able on the East Coast to scratch the heart of this a little bit, but I'm going in a, in a completely different way, so I don't want all my folks online in the East Coast to think this is a rerun. It's not that way at all. <clears throat> They have an enemy between their last and between their next. You got to understand, Exodus is the book where they are exiting their taskmasters, exiting the land of bondage, okay? They are being delivered by the hand of God. But deliverance is not freedom. Deliverance is not freedom. I told you about the, the land we had one time. I'm not cruel, love my animals, this and that and other, but we bought, back out in the country in South Carolina time, we bought 18 acres. Because you can buy a lot of land cheap back there. We bought 18 acres. I didn't have the money to fence all that, but I wanted great big outside dogs. So I put one of the electrical fences in the ground. And that's where, you know, they quickly learn their boundaries. You know, they can run all over the 18 acres, but don't want you to run in the road. You know, they learn their boundaries. And so one day I went and I took the collar off the dog and told him to climb up in the truck with me. You know, I would just, come on, let's go to the store. Come on up with me. And I took the collar off so that I delivered him from that. But I got him to that line and he stood. And I had to pick that dog up because that dog would not cross that line. Even though I had delivered him, like these people at the altar today, you got delivered. But you're not free. Free is here. So God has delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, but they've been in slavery 450 years. So God's got to take them the long way. Why? Because slaves were not used to fighting wars. 
They had somebody do it for them. My mentor, who's going to be with the Lord now, Dr. Miles Monroe, wrote a book called The Burden of Freedom. Freedom is difficult because freedom means you got to have your own boundaries. When you are free, when you are a free people, you have to create your own boundaries. And there was one thing that was attractive about Egypt. They didn't like what they had to do. They didn't like somebody telling them what to do. They didn't like somebody telling them how much food they could have, when to get up, when to go to bed. But you know what? You don't have to worry about anything because you're miserable, but you're secure. And so now you've got these people who have been miserably secure and God's got a great land, a land flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants on the way. And God said, these people are not built internally. They've not been freed enough in their mind to see if they were engaged in warfare, they wouldn't keep going forward, they would go right back. So God said, I can't take them the short route, I gotta take them the long route. Which means I'm telling you, before God takes you out of your past and into your next, you're going to have to learn to embrace process. And that's about how I thought it would go over. Like a moan. We live in a generation where you can hit a thing on a phone and a car will show up and pick you up. Folks, that's nuts if you think about it. Now, some of you kids, you were raised in it. But some of us who were in our 30s, we were not. Just want to see if you're on your toes. There has been a thing called a microwave that's been around for generations, actually. I'm still amazed that you can put a block of cheese in there for 60 seconds, come out and it's melted. And the thing ain't even hot. That's crazy to me. It used to take me 10 to 12 hours to prepare a message for Sunday. Because if you came in my room, Friday was my study day. I'd go in there, had a pot of coffee, I would wear sweats, I wouldn't take any meetings, and I would prepare all day. Why? Because Hope can tell you, because I had 15 books laying out everywhere. I had a little sofa and I had books laying all over the sofa. I was sitting in the floor, I had papers all over the floor. I had books all over my desk. And now I Google. And now I can do a message in half the time because all that's gone. And so now we get saved and we think God is American. (laughs) We think God lives in our culture. And what we don't know about God is not only does he not live in our culture, God is a counterculture. In America, they've made Christians a subculture. Just another subculture in America. Christians are not a subculture, we are a counterculture. We have been put in the world to be a light in a dark place, to be sheep among the wolves, the salt of the earth, a city set on a hill. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So the church was never supposed to embrace culture. It was supposed to be God's element in the earth to counter culture. A new way, a better way, a blessed way. That's what we were put here to do. So here's Moses. Moses, I mess, I'm major on the minor again. God help me. I just got so much I need to say right here. Moses, somebody said, bless him, Lord. Yeah, he does need to bless me right now. He needs to help me. He needs to help me go faster, hallelujah. Let me move on. God has gotten them out of Egypt, but now he's got to take them the long way to get Egypt out of them. God can break an addiction, but now God has got to get the lifestyle of the addiction out of you. God can give you money, but you gotta break the hustle that you learned on the streets. I know, I know, I'm working hard for my claps. I know, I get it. See, that stuff takes more time, okay? 
They say you can take them out of the country and put them in the city. You can physically remove them, but because you physically remove. I mean, my wife, we, we live in the Bay Area of California, and she still fix cabbage and cornbread. Do you see what I'm talking about? And about 80 y'all clap, because the rest of y'all like, what's cornbread and cabbage? <laughs> but I know if I'm going to eat it, I got to go to her house. Do you see what I'm talking about? That, that stuff takes longer. I delivered my great big dog. But in his mind, I can't go past this line. And you gotta understand that takes longer. And so that took Israel 40 years for God to flush that captivity out of them. 40 years. Now the wilderness season is nothing but God doing something to bring change in you. Listen now, you go through the wilderness season so God can do things in you in internally so that you can be able to handle the weight of the blessing because the blessing is heavy. Listen to this. Listen to this. Because God fed them in Egypt, God fed them in the wilderness. They wake up, there's manna on the ground. That's a pretty good day. And when they need some meat, he makes quail fly low, snatch them out there. Water out of a rock, pretty good. But the Bible said when they got to the promised land, the promised land, the manna ceased. So in other words, he said, Pharaoh took care of you and you never had enough. I took care of you in the wilderness and you had just enough. But now I've taken you into a land of more than enough and you're going to have to work it. I just dropped a bomb right there. Egypt's never enough. God will give you just enough. But if you want to live in overflow, you're going to have to work that land. You're gonna to have to get up and be diligent and be disciplined about something every single day of your life. You're gonna to have to apply your passion. You're gonna to have to apply your focus, learn how to do things you don't like with just as much passion as the things that you do like. Come on, you're gonna to have to learn how to be diligent. You're gonna to have to learn how to set boundaries. You're gonna to have to learn how to manage your time. All these things are gonna be in play. And they had to do none of that in Egypt. Now I don't like Egypt, but I didn't have to think in Egypt. And I go out in the wilderness and I don't like leaving in a tent, but God gives me a pillar of cloud by day, an air conditioner, and he gives me a pillar of fire by night. He gives me heat and he gives me manna and he gives me quail and he gives me water. And now I'm coming into this fortified city and there is no more manna. There's no water out of a rock, but it's overflowing with resources if you will work it. Tell somebody, say, it'll work if you work it. Come on, somebody, it'll work. You... <sighs> Captivity's over. A land flowing with milk and honey is coming. And in the middle, God said, I don't want them to see their enemy. Usually when God is asking you to walk into a new season, it's a season of pure faith and it's something you can't see. It's a season where you have a word and God has spoken that word to you. It is not for the faint of heart. For anybody who mocks our faith, I would like them to see, see them come live it. The life of faith is not an easy faith. People like the life of science and data and proof. We're living a life of faith. So I have been called by God to trust a God that I can't see, to hear a word that I can't see, and believe that he's gonna do a thing that I've never seen before. That's what I've been called to do. Everybody who thinks that's easy, come on to my house and help me live that with me. <laughs> okay? That's, that's the life of faith. They don't know what a promised land looks like. But God knows they're certainly not ready to fight for it. 
They're in no organization. They're in no order. They don't have a moral code. They don't have a police department. They don't have a judicial department. They don't have an educational system. They don't have a commerce system. They don't have a banking system. That's why God has to start with the Ten Commandments. All right, before we build all this other stuff, here's what's right and here's what's wrong. I mean, God, they don't even have a moral code. So God starts them out with the basics. And God says, now that I'm getting them out, if they see the Philistines one time, Philistines is where Goliath came from. He said, if they see that, they're running. He said, so I gotta take them another route. And I've gotta build something in them that will help them be ready to engage their enemy and handle the blessing that's on the other side. Let me tell you something about blessing. Blessing is heavy. Blessing is heavy. Blessing is difficult to manage. Very difficult to manage. The Bible says to him who has given much, much is required. So in other words, everybody's praying for more, 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 more. You know what? Then you got to manage more, 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 and more. You've got to keep up with more, more, more. And when you get more, more, and more, there's somebody else that wants to take your more and more and more and more and more. There's usually an assault on your senses. I don't want them to see the Philistines. Now, I've given them a word. I'm taking you to a land flowing on milk and honey. They haven't seen it. All they have is a word. And God knows what you see can talk you out of what he said. The Bible said, somebody said again, God knows that what you see can talk you out of what he said. You gotta understand, faith and sight totally contradict each other. Most people think the opposite of faith is doubt. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is sight. Because the Bible says who hopes for or believes for the thing that they can see. If I can see it, I don't have to hold hope in my heart. I'm having faith for something that I know is real but I've never held it in my hand. Do you understand what I'm saying? Am I all right? Am I, are we doing okay? Can I keep preaching? I got to get you out of here. Can I keep preaching? All right. So usually when God gives you a word, heaven and earth will pass away, but that word will remain. And God is faithful and he watches over his word to perform it and he'll not let his word return unto him void, but he will let it accomplish the purpose for which he's seen it. The Bible says that he watches over his word closely. You gotta understand that God's name is writing on his word and his word is writing on his name. They're intertwined and he's not gonna let either one of them go down. So if you have a promise, you can take that thing to the bank. One thing your God cannot do, the Bible says he is not a man that he should lie. People will lie to you all the time, but God will not tell you a lie. If God has spoken a word to you, the God who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Come on, somebody. I need to know that you're with me. I need to know that. But now, in between the last door closing and the next door opening, the enemy wants to show you something that will talk you out of it. And God knew that tended to be the tendency, especially if our infrastructure is not strong and theirs was not yet. The Bible says that they saw Jesus on the water and thought it was a ghost. Peter spoke up and said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. And Jesus said, come to me. And the Bible says Peter got on the boat and he started walking. The Bible, the heading in your Bible says that Peter walked on the water. That is not true. Peter did not walk on water. Peter walked on word. If Jesus had not had said come, he would have sunk right to the bottom of the sea. But when God said word, he stepped, when God said come, he stepped out on that word and that word caused him to defy every law of physics because when you have word, you don't need physics or science or facts on your side. I'm about to run around this building. I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. Somebody shout amen. And he's walking and he's walking. And the Bible says that he saw that the, way, the wind and the waves were contrary. Contrary, in other words, the waves were blowing against what was happening. And when he saw the wind and the waves, he began to sink. 
because you have one thing between that door closing and this door opening. You can walk on what you heard or you can look at what you see. And whichever one you focus on is the one that will determine your outcome. If you look at everything around you, you're gonna sink before you open your next door. But if you can hold on to the word, God said, I'm watching over it to perform it and I'll not let it return to me void. And some of you need to get out of your boat and walk on the word of God because your next season is so much greater than your last. I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to let God know how how excited you are about your word walk. Ah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Shout amen! Touch your neighbor and say word walking, word walking, word walking. God shows me a great church in the Bay Area. Four, 50 years old, move across the country. Nobody does that, especially east to west. People come here, work, sell their home, go east and buy a mansion. Nobody goes east to west, especially not at my age. God shows me a great church. Okay, I'm here a few months, COVID, bam. So God, what happens? I know what he told me. And then all the winds contrary. But I was here for a year, running around this building by myself, not speaking what I saw, which was three 3,500 empty chairs. I thank you, Lord, that this building is full. I thank you that there's a revival coming to this land. I thank you, Lord, that you're raising up something mighty that this West Coast has never seen. Do you know how hard it is when the building is empty and people in the hospital dying and you got to wear a mask and you can't go to work? And I'm walking right here talking about a move of God and talking about full building. Somebody needs to understand if God said a thing, he will do what he said. Uh, give me just a minute. I know what time it is. Yes. Go back to verse uh, 18, please. And the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks. Tell your neighbor, say, this is going to sting a little. You can't read the Bible and not be stung every once in a while. Here is the beginning. That word or orderly ranks means to harness, organize, and discipline. So God is taking them the long way while he harnesses them, organizes them, and builds discipline in them. Because the promised land takes organization, it takes boundaries, it takes discipline. Can I say something? We're in a motivational speaker age too. It's amazing the money people make to motivate I, I'm, I'm not being hypocritical. I do it. I listen to it. Uh, I have been asked to go be a part of it several times. Okay? But inspiration and motivation are not going to get you where you're supposed to go. Discipline's going to get you where you're supposed to go. <laughs> motivation and inspiration will come and go. Discipline will cause you to stay the course when you're not motivated at all. And Jesus took them out into the wilderness not to inspire them. Discipline. Well, that's not really, that's not my God. He got 12 disciples. What is the root word of disciple? Discipline. He took 12 unruly, motley crew members. 
and he reined them in and said, we're going to create boundaries and we're going to live this lifestyle when this lifestyle's not fun and when I'm not motivated to. I'm not, I don't get up every morning motivated to be a Christian. I know you're terribly disappointed in that. I don't get up every morning and say, man, I, I'm glad I got up. I couldn't wait to forgive somebody. So he put them in orderly rank. Let me get this last one out. Go ahead and play something for me. I'm going to stop. <clears throat> there are common battles. Transmission breaks. You know, your kid got in trouble at school. Those are not uncommon. Everybody's going through that. But then there are uncommon battles. How many of you, you sense that your battle is not really normal? You're in an uncommon conflict right now and you're in an uncommon place. About a third to half of people. You need to track that. Because I'm going to show you the enemy's hand. He only fights what he fears. If there is something in your life that it is under some kind of constant, insane, where you look at it and say, really? Again? You need to track that. If you have a child, and this certain child, I mean, has not had the sun shine on it a day since it's been born. You need to watch that one. There's a reason that kid's being fought. Because there's something inside that kid the enemy fears greatly. If your health is constantly fought, the enemy fears a healthy you. That's right. That's right. If your economy, you say, man, I'm so tired of it. I see people thriving all around me and me, I'm trying to stretch it to pay rent. Why is, and it, and it seems like it just continues in my, you need to track that because the enemy knows your wealth would damage his kingdom so greatly. If your marriage is under and this like an assassin is after it. Pastor, we've been through more in 10 years than most people do in 10 lifetimes. Okay? Then there's something about you that is much more powerful together than you would be individually. And I've learned something in these years I've been serving God. When there is this incessant attack in various areas, the enemy fights what he's afraid of. He fights what he's afraid of. And some of you, I can see the light coming on as I'm saying that. It's, it's, it's why I wrote the book. It's not just random stuff. Just my life is crappy. Oh no. Actually, it's very strategic. Not only is it not random, it is so strategic. The enemy, as I could read you the Bible, is very organized. His kingdom is not divided and he wastes no energy. So if there's something that you're battling, there's something that's powerful and you've got to know that and you've got to engage your enemy and you must overcome. Can you give Jesus praise? Have you been loving Pastor Ron's latest series as much as we have? In honor of it, Pastor Ron is giving away copies of his book, The Necessity of an Enemy. For your chance to win, go to roncarpenter.com 
slash enemies. If you want to download Pastor Ron's message for free, you can. All you have to do is go to roncarpenter.com slash message to get the download. If today's worship experience blessed you, please consider supporting the ministry by giving. You can visit roncarpenter.com to give and learn more about us. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next week here on iChurch Live.